I'm Paula James, Research Associate in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, and I want to share my excitement with you over this 1920s Transport and General Workers' Union banner. It's a dockside branch banner, and the dockers have quite a history of protest. From a mass strike of unskilled and skilled workers in the late 1880s, the struggle against casualisation and for a daily living wage, the dockers tanner. The leaders of the union at that time were taught to read by Eleanor Marx, daughter of Karl Marx, and they bucked the trend of elaborate designs on banners and membership certificates for the unions by producing a big banner with a Hercules muscle man at the centre of a circular picture, the roundel or medallion. Originally, the colours would have been much brighter and like many banners, it is an accomplished painting. Emblems were often commissioned by trades unions from Royal Academy artists and produced in the large George Tuttle workshops. If we put ourselves in the place of this upright worker and read the words he is uttering, we seek knowledge that we may wield power, then I think we should be quite stirred by his dignity and determination. On the other hand, he's far lower than the three establishment figures on the rostrum and seems to be pleading with them. We have a full view of their contemptuous faces. The officer, the teacher in his academic robes, the bloated industrialist. They are probably all serving in the House of Commons or the House of Lords and they block the way to books and betterment and education. The church is not represented here, but the trio sitting in judgment on a son of toil are like an unholy trinity, and they occupy a godlike place on the raised platform. In fact, there is a carefully thought out structure here, as the flattened pyramid shape is actually the ziggurat or crepidoma, an ancient temple structure for the shrines of the gods. It was a humble blacksmith designer, James Sharples, who placed the craft workers of his trade on just such a ziggurat as the heroes of their newly amalgamated engineering union, this way back in 1851. I find it fascinating that the workers have been relegated to the floor in the 1920s TGWU banner. But if you were one of the high and mighty, would you be wondering if this image is about toppling the privileged, portrayed as corrupt, contemptuous and cruel? In short, the ruling classes were not for persuading, but for sweeping away. The thing to remember about the banners is that they were in-your-face popular art, paraded at open-air events and especially on marches. They were unfurled at union branch meetings and trades council events. So they made strong statements about the workers they represented, but for many years they were not confrontational, rather reassuring about sharing the culture of the ruling classes. We don't know when and where this banner appeared, but surely it was paraded in public during the 1920s, as the tradition of witty and creative placards and also new and historic banners are still very much a part of protest. They are a visual feast. Every picture tells a story. And they also cement solidarity and identity amongst the marchers, communicating a strong sense of triumph and victory to be won. As we started with some historical context, let's remember that the human cost of World War I was the loss of millions of working class lives. There was a new mood of militancy in Europe reinforced by a revolutionary surge in Russia. Soviet posters depicted toiling masses with outstretched arms being ground down by larger-than-life, wealthy and heartless capitalists. They might even come in threes. And Lenin and the leadership of the Bolshevik government prioritised education and free access to knowledge and culture for all. And harking back to the Hercules strike banner, it too had a green and red background. These are the colours of conflict. So curtain up for a new dawn of a better society, I would say.
more from the Open University, check out the links on screen now.